I use a phrase with my work. Um, I call it seeing silence. And for me, when I'm in the landscape, I am so absorbed in what's around me that all of the noise in my head dissipates completely. I do not think about work or family or health or you know any of the stuff that churns away constantly in our subconscious. And it's the only time I ever feel completely free of the day to day. That's it for me. What I'm looking at, what I'm seeing is bringing me silence. That's one of many quotes I could have pulled from this week's guest, Wendy Bagnall. If you're into landscape photography or if you're on any kind of creative journey, there's so much in this episode for you. So stick around. We'll meet Wendy in a minute. Welcome to the Viewfinders Photography Podcast. My name's Graham Jargi. I'm a professional photographer based in the Granite City, Aberdeen, Scotland. And this is the show where we delve into the thoughts of some of the best photographers from around the world with the aim of inspiring all of us to take the next bold steps on our photography journeys. I hope you and your photography are doing well. For me, this last couple of weeks, I've been shooting more corporate stuff, Um, One fun job I had was shooting some in-house stock photography for a big accounting firm here in Aberdeen. Um, So, you know, pictures for their blog posts, uh, internal documents, proposals, LinkedIn updates, whatever else. And a lot of businesses will just grab these kind of business team shots from an online stock library like Shutterstock, iStock, that kind of thing. But occasionally, a business wants images that are truly their own. So... I went in there and had a great day shooting different business teams and individuals, uh, pairs of people having meetings, working at desks, um, talking on phones, whatever else. And as boring as that sounds, it's a really, really good fun day actually, just setting up the shots, balancing the flash with the ambient light, talking people through the different scenarios that we have to play out and just drilling it down to those final few images that the client really needs. So super fun, challenging, but really good work for me. So really enjoying my photography at the moment. Long may that continue. Um, Apart from photography, I went to a roller disco with my daughter at the weekend. That was great fun. Um, There's not a permanent roller rink in my town. So it's like a pop-up thing they do once a month. So they pack in as many folk as they can. And there's disco lights and terrible music, but I get to skate with my little girl and that makes it all worthwhile. That's me. How about you? What have you been up to this week? I'd love to see your photography, so connect with me on Instagram at Viewfinders Podcast. And don't forget to check out the nearly 50 previous episodes of the show with amazing guests like Paul Sanders, Valda Bailey, Kai Hornung, Julia Reddle, many more amazing photographers from all around the world. Okay, one more thing before we dive in. If you're listening to this in real time, the week the episode comes out, we're just a few days away from my next Viewfinders Live event with amazing Paul Sanders. Paul is one of our best photographers here in the UK who's a recognized leader in the field of mindful photography. He's a Fujifilm ambassador and a mental health advocate. If you like Wendy Bagnell and if you enjoy this episode, I know you're going to love Paul and his work and his whole vibe. So why not join me, Paul, and an audience from around the world on Zoom on Thursday the 13th of October at 7.30pm UK time. It's going to be a great night in where you can hit the sofa, stick the headphones in, forget about work and just be inspired by a photographer who's doing fantastic photography but also really important work around mental health. By coming along, you'll be supporting Paul's work and you'll also be helping me to keep making new episodes of the podcast. So it's a win for everybody. Tickets are available at viewfinderslive.com and for you as a podcast listener, you can use the code VF10VF10 to save 10% on your ticket. I hope you can make it. It's going to be a great night. All right, my guest this week is Wendy Bagnall, landscape photographer based in the south of England whose work was recently shown at the 2022 Royal Academy of Arts Summer Exhibition in London. Wendy's work is unrestricted and playful, and she uses different techniques to interpret the landscape, creating images that evoke an emotional connection with the viewer. Wendy got her first camera as a child, but she went deeper into photography during the pandemic, 
when forced isolation gave her the opportunity to build a relationship with the landscape in her local area and fast-tracked her development as a photographer. Wendy is one of my favourite landscape photographers right now and this is definitely one of my favourite conversations I've had on the podcast. I found Wendy's whole attitude refreshing and inspirational and I came away from our time together thinking differently about my approach to my own photography. I'm so looking forward to sharing this with you. Here's my conversation with Wendy Bagnall. Wendy Bagnall, welcome to Viewfinders Podcast. How are you? I'm very good, thank you, Graham. Thank you very much for having me. No, you're totally welcome. It's a pleasure. I'm so excited to have you. Um, I realised that we find you at probably quite an exciting moment just now. Um, do you want to just bring me and the listeners up to speed on what's happening for you in your photography journey right now? Yeah, so um, so it's been a busy year, actually, uh, and um, it, it's all come about really quite quickly and unexpectedly, but I'm currently exhibiting at the Royal Academy of Arts in the summer exhibition. Sorry, that was my door slamming with the wind. Um, okay. Yeah, so I, I entered the, um, the Royal Academy exhibition. <clears throat> I was encouraged to by a good friend that I met on Instagram. She's an artist. And, um, uh, you know, it was sort of a bit uh, hesitant, like we all are as photographers, you know, we kind of wonder if our work's good enough and, and that sort of thing. And But um, anyway, I gave it a shot and um, uh, was delighted to um, have been successful. So it's been a really busy summer. Um, it's been really exciting. And um, it's been a great sort of learning curve, the whole experience with selling prints through the exhibition and you know, engaging with clients and fulfilling the orders and invoicing and lots of, um, lots of, uh, you know, the kind of admining and sort of backroom stuff that goes with selling prints. So, um, so yeah, that's been a, a big thing for me this summer. Um, mm. and I've had a few other bits and pieces going on. I've, I've um, been invited to, um, podcasts like, like yourself. And I got asked to write an article earlier this year for Elements Photography Magazine, um, which was an absolute honour, and um, uh, a camera club approached me, um, and I had a couple of um, approaches to um, have my work presented by online galleries. Um, so yeah, it's been a great year, really busy, um, lots going on, lots to consider and think about. Mm -hmm. With the Royal Academy of Arts thing, so how does that come about? Do you apply to be a part of that show or what's the process for that? Um, so it's the world, I believe it's the world's largest open submission exhibition. Um, okay. And it's been running since 1769. Um, wow. So it's been going for a long time, um, completely uninterrupted actually, even with COVID. Um, I think one year they ran it online and then um they did it in the winter uh, in the other year because they weren't able to host it in the summer um and basically they invite um professional artists to exhibit works and then they have an open submission uh for anybody who wants to enter any artist and they cover you know many forms of art there's architecture sculpture um painting photography printmaking, even textiles. So it's a great opportunity for anybody who um, has their finger in one of the art pies, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and you submit your works. Um, there's an initial online viewing um, process that they go through to shortlist people. And then if you're shortlisted, you're invited to take your work up to the RA. Um, which is quite a nerve wracking experience. Um, and then it goes through um, a, a sort of, you know, final judging round. Um, it's quite ruthless. There's actually a program about it on BBC Two that's um, it's on iPlayer called Joe Lysett's Summer Exhibitionist. Um, and he sort of, um, you know, walks walks you through the process and, and the, um, the kind of judging process and things it's got because it's such a, uh, there's, there's such a history to it all. There's a lot of traditions that are involved in it. Um, and um, yeah, so that's that's kind of the process to get into it. And I'm not a big fan of photography competitions. I have entered one or two, but I don't like the idea of art being considered something that deserves 
a first, second or third place kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, making photography or a painting or a sculpture, it's not a race. Um, You know, it's a creative expression. Whereas an open submission exhibition, yes, there are pieces that will and won't get in, but it's not about saying, well, you haven't got in because you're not first, second or third. Mm -hmm. It's more about what fits with the theme. This year's theme was climate. Mm -hmm. So so my work, as soon as I saw the theme, I knew exactly which piece I wanted to enter. Um, So, so yeah, that's been a a great experience for me. And actually it, it, it makes me think more about looking towards open submission exhibitions as opposed to the sort of competition environment. Mm -hmm. just well let's dive into that then yeah usually we talk about your specific photographs later but um the piece that you entered is uh it's a beautiful photograph called fragility do you would you like to uh, try to describe that and talk about the image and how it came about and what it means to you yeah sure so um so there's a there's a, a series of commons near where I live, and um, fragility was uh, made on one of the commons, and um, it's a common which has suffered with um, wildfires in the past, and there was a devastating wildfire in 2020. Um, I believe it affected about one third of the common, and the area sort of over the last two years has been regenerating. Um, but amongst everything that's regrowing, there's still a lot of charred, um, you know, shrubs and trees and foliage. And it really caught my eye, this contrast between the regeneration um, and and then the aspects of the landscape that clearly weren't going to recover. But there was still a real delicate nature to um, to, to the parts that were dead um their form their structure their shape um and they had a real story to tell and i just found the place and i still do find the place when i visit i find it such a powerful um landscape to visit and to view because of um this kind of juxtaposition between life and death kind of grief and hope um and so the photograph that i made shows these very delicate, um, fragile structures. You know, there were sort of young, um, young shrubs growing amongst long grasses, and the grasses are flourishing, um, and and the, and these young shrubs didn't survive. Um, so they're very much in the foreground. And I always go for sunrise to this location, and you often get fog. It's a very boggy area, um, and that that sort of waterlogged ground helps create fog in the mornings um and so the the background is 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 shrouded in a a light fog it was quite late sunrise actually so the sun was quite high and so everything was quite illuminated and then you've got some really big scots pines in that area as well and they're sort of in the background and and they um and they're all sort of you know the background fades away with the fog so um and then you you, there's kind of like a mid-ground with reeds and um if you look really really closely at the image printed up large you can see a goose hiding in the reeds <laughs> oh, <cool. laughs> um so that's that's kind of yeah the, it's kind of what attracts me to it and and what the what the picture's about mm-hmm. yeah it's such a beautiful image very soft and um yeah those contrasts are present as you said it's great um so i i just wonder like with the exhibition what kind of exposure does that give you? And, you know, it's obviously it's amazing to be a part of it. But do you think that will be a game changer for you in any way going forward? Or what do you do from here? Do you use it as a springboard? You, talk, you talked about maybe uh, applying to other exhibitions and so on. But how do you see that changing things going forward? Um, so it's uh, I've not been approached by anyone in terms of, you know, I've not had a somebody approached me and say, oh, you know, can you exhibit in, in our gallery or, or anything along those lines? Um, and I'm glad, actually, because I'm currently, um, I'm working with a mentor um, to really understand my photography, um, why I photograph. I have a pretty good understanding of why I do it, but, you know, sort of 
crystallizing it and articulating it um, and then with a view to understanding how you host a solo exhibition because it's very easy to go into these things a bit blind and get it wrong. Um, so um, I think I was saying earlier that I ha have had a couple of approaches about, um, you know, being asked if I'd like my work to be exhibited, in one in a, in a physical gallery and one was um, in an online gallery. Um, and then the initial sort of, I was overwhelmed with excitement initially, but sort of took stock and reflected on things and decided that actually neither of them were quite the right um, platform for me. Um, mm -hmm. But what it has done is it's given me, um, it's given me a lot of experience um, in terms of the whole process of going from having made your photograph to exhibiting it in a place where you know it's going to be seen by thousands of people. I mean, the footfall in the Royal Academy over the two months that the exhibition is open is huge. Mm -hmm. um, and so you, it forces you to reflect and think very carefully about how you present your work. Um, and then the process of actually executing that. So, you know, printing, framing, what kind of framing? Is it float mounted, deckled edges? So I feel like I've gained a huge amount um, in that respect. Um, and then, as I said, the other end of it, the, the invoicing and the and the shipping and um, mm -hmm. personalising my stationery to to make it, an, you know, a good user experience for the um, for the client that's bought the piece. Mm -hmm. So the Royal Academy, it's in central London, I think. Is that right? Yeah, it's Piccadilly. It's at the, oh. um, it's Burlington House. Right, yeah. So it's a big, big deal, just yeah, yeah. apart from the history and everything that we mentioned. But I, we, I was in London a couple of weeks ago. And yeah, this time of year, it's mega. I mean, there <laughs> must just be millions of people going around. So I wonder in terms of the setting up then do you get to go in and, and set things up or do they just say look that's your slot over there get on with it how did that work so um they uh, see so the the ra um the royal Academic academicians um they set the whole exhibition up so there's my room was um curated by bill woodrow um and he basically selected the pieces for that room. So there are several rooms within the exhibition. Um, and they also then choose how to present the work and, and how it hangs on the walls. Um, so you don't have, as an artist, you don't have any say in where it hangs or what it hangs next to. That's all done by um, the artists at the RA. Um, so what I got to do though which was really special they have a thing called varnishing day and all of the artists are invited before the exhibition opens to go along to the academy um to take part in a special um church service which might sound a little unusual but um it's you know it's part of the history part of the tradition it's just across the road in piccadilly um so a short 30 minute service which is all about you know being thankful for art and artists and then we get to go into the RA and see the whole exhibition before it's open to the public. Um, and, and that's when you, you, you know, you, you, you find your piece um, on the wall in there. Um, so that, that's how they do it. Yeah. That's, I can imagine how special that is. It must really bond everybody, you know, and, and everyone's going in to see it in the, yeah. for the first time with that kind of community feel. Um, super excited for you. That is just so amazing. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I was going to, I was interested when you talked about having a mentor. It sounded like if you're okay to talk about that, uh, I don't need to know who that is or anything, but it sounded like your mentor is more about helping you understand your whys about your photography rather than, you know, how to take better photographs kind of thing. Would, th would that be right? Could you talk about that a little? Yeah, so I don't mind mentioning who it is. It's a chap called Luke Whittaker, and he owns the Bosom Gallery. Um, okay. The actual physical gallery down in Bosom has um, has closed. I, I think it, you know, like a lot of um, a lot of small galleries. It, I, I think there were changes that came about from COVID, um, but the, he's still very much working in that space, and um, he has a you know the gallery still exists online. Um, so yeah it's not like a photography workshop or um, you know I'm, I'm i'm not learning photography skills as it were um it's it's more about the um the business side of it and then the um the, the artist's intent shall we say mm -hmm. and 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 
sort of discussing and really thinking hard about what your photography means to you, why you make it, why why you're attracted to um, certain techniques or certain um, conditions or landscapes. Um, so that's the main thrust of it. Mm-hmm. So and does that help you to gain clarity about what you would do next and where your path would go in the future, if that makes sense? It it does, and and I'm sort of you know I'm I'm about halfway through this program, so uh, uh, by the end of it, I'll have a plan um, that that I can use to guide me. Um, but I use the word plan loosely because I still um, I still feel like I'm very much in the infancy of my photography career, and with that, I don't want to set myself rigid boundaries um i want to make sure i can remain a bit fluid and flexible because i think certainly for me my photography comes from the place i'm in now and you know that place will change in the future um and and when i say the place i don't mean the geographical place the, the sort of emotional um place so um so i think uh the plan will be a great guide um, but it won't be something that I will see as that, that is set in stone. Okay, usually we start with going back. So I was wondering um, if you were a creative kid or w- was photography always part of your life? Um, yeah, to some extent it was. Um, and I'm not going to pretend that I've been doing photography to this level all of my life, but it is definitely something that has been at my core since a young child. So I bought my first 35 millimeter camera when I was about 10 years old. We'd had a a little bet within the family and I I won 11 pounds. So I went straight out to Boots and bought my first camera. Um, And I think, you know, when I think back on that, at that age, I really could have spent that money on anything else, you know, at the age around age 10, 11 year perhaps interested in things like a Walkman or something. I'm showing my age now, aren't I? (laughs) Um, So so it started there and that camera served me well for a very long time. Um, Mm. And then um, when I was in my um, early 30s, I sort of picked photography up a bit more. You know, we had the advent of digital cameras um, and then... I got my first DSLR around then. Um, So I started to play with that. Um, But uh, life gets in the way, you know, children, careers, um, family. So I want to say it took a backseat, but in a way it didn't because with the advent of cameras on mobile phones, I never stopped taking photographs. And I wasn't just taking photographs of you know, the family on a walk. If we were on a walk, actually, the family rarely got a look in. I was often composing compositions of the landscape around me, Mm -hmm. albeit only on my mobile phone, and then sharing them usually on Facebook. Um, But um, so that was always there. And then I was very fortunate. Um, You know, I I like to think every cloud has a silver lining. And when COVID struck, I was um, one of those folk that had to stay away from everyone. Um, I have a a broken immune system, shall we say. So so I was home-based. I couldn't do my job from home. Um, And that first three months, I just picked up my camera and it was, it saved my sanity. It really did Mm. Um, because I'm not the kind of person that can easily feel confined to you know, one space. Um, So, uh, you know, I was allowed out and and keep my distance and things, but I I used to go out into the local landscape and walking and I started to research photographers um, a bit more. Um, And and then I invested a huge amount of time in it. I mean, I think the amount of time I, I put into it in that year, in 2020, was probably equivalent to what I could have put into it over five years or even you know, longer um, in, a, in a context where I would have been working, you know, a full time job. Um, so I, I learned a lot very rapidly. And um, 
yeah, it's, and, I, and I haven't looked back and I don't believe I ever will look back because it just brings me so much. Um, mm. it, you know, it really does give me a lot. Um, so, yeah. Mm. So your photography before the pandemic and then when you when we sort of, if we've come out of it at all, but, you know, from now, um, what was it like before compared to what it's like now like how far have you come do you, would you say so um it was it was classic i would say more classic landscapes before and um and that whereas now i use more creative techniques you know i i do use quite a bit of multiple exposure um so i would say it's, it's changed in that respect but i think one of the things which has changed more so um is that i feel more of a connection to the landscape when I'm out with my camera now um, and I think that when you have that connection with something that comes through much more in your photography um, people often say to me oh they always know when they see a photograph of mine on Instagram for example before they even know that it's mine mm -hmm. uh, which I find interesting because I don't I don't um, have a signature style you know i'm not a black and white photographer or i'm not a seascape photographer or a woodland photographer um so i do find it interesting that there does seem to be something in my photographic voice that is consistent across my work that people do pick up on um mm -hmm. i think the other thing i should say as well that that was probably quite influential on me was um my dad got into photography when i was about 17 18 um he used to mostly kind of do portraits um but he got himself a, i think it was a pentax um 35 millimeter camera and i remember he converted our downstairs cloakroom into a dark room <laughs> mm -hmm. um so uh, we used to go in there together and i used to watch him you know process his um photographs and most of them were black and white as well um mm -hmm. So he didn't he didn't sort of take it really far, but it was a hobby for him. And mm -hmm. and I used to just really enjoy spending that time with him and learning. But at the same time, I was 18 and I was interested in, you know, everything that 18 year olds are interested in at that time. So, yeah, yeah. that I can see that being influential, though. The dark room is a magic place. Yeah. Add your, in, the influence of your dad it's, it's going to make a mark, isn't it? Yeah. OK, so. What I was thinking of when you were talking there was maybe I'm reading too much into this, so let me know. But maybe when the lockdowns were on, you were quite isolated. You talked about having a, a relationship with the landscape. Mm -hmm. I think that, I don't know if that's the word you use or if that was just how I was re uh, receiving it in my mind. So I was wondering, being being isolated being like truly isolated from other people and then now the landscape is like your friend kind of thing you would have spent the most time out there do you think that was a bonding experience for you to the landscape in a way does that make sense yes and that um so i i use a phrase with my work um i call it seeing silence um and for me, when I'm in the landscape with my camera, uh, which is very different to being in the landscape without my camera, I ought to add. Um, but with my camera, I am so absorbed in the landscape and what's around me that um, all of the noise in my head dissipates completely. I do not think about um work or family or health or you know any of the stuff that churns away constantly in our subconscious um and it's the only time i ever feel completely free um of the day-to-day -day. Mm -hmm. so when i when i refer to that connection and that relationship with the landscape that's it for me what i'm looking at what i'm seeing is bringing me silence mm -hmm. I can tell you the title of this episode will be Wendy Bagnell Seeing Silence. Um, <laughs> that's decided. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, one of the things I was going to ask you was you're, I, I think you're very observant. I think that you are seeing things in the landscape that a lot of us might walk past. So what are you looking for to give you the go ahead 
to to start working on a photograph does that make sense yeah it does um so i never go out with any preconceived ideas i am really drawn to fog um i think a, a lot of photographers are um but fog really brings a i think it emphasizes the quietness in the landscape and it gives us that separation from things mm -hmm. so if i see fog or a fog forecast then you know I'll, i'm up and out with my camera um but when i'm there in the landscape i don't um i don't go along thinking oh i know that tree or that section of woodland that's what i'm going to photograph today i just walk and look and something catches my eye and i tend to take the view if it's caught my eye then it's caught my eye for a reason and there is something about it that that i then look at study a bit more um and it can be anything from frozen water droplets on you know some delicate branches um to um a family of scots pines um to storm waves to autumn woodland um you know it's if it's caught my eye then there's something in it that has connected with me and then i look at that closer and then i and then i start to see in my my imagination if you like um how i want to use the camera as a tool to interpret that into a photograph so that it emphasizes what it is that's caught my eye so some of my work uh, you know using multiple exposures or um the way i will underexpose using the histogram or go more high key um is so that i can really filter the parts of the scene that aren't interesting me um and bring out the elements that have attracted me mm -hmm. that i love the permission that you give yourself on that um where you you, you seem unbound I, I love talking to landscape photographers who are who say similar things um and in fact it says on i think on your website somewhere you uh, your work's unrestrictive and playful i really admire that i i find like my landscape photography is quite um um formulaic i guess you could say it. it's i mean i'm really into it i'm looking i'm i'm doing my best for all that stuff but i i go i think i'm quite formal about it because i'm i'm a, I, i'm of quite a professional and formal approach i'm going to go and get something and mm -hmm. talk about this a little bit on the podcast before but i love i i do i think i would struggle with the the unrestrictedness you know um, and I, I really admire that you give yourself the permission to just see what you see and be curious and, and look into that. And so would there be some of your work is sort of traditional photography, other work is sort of abstract using ICM or multiple exposures from what I can gather for just from mm -hmm. looking at it. Um, when would you decide to go one way or another like traditional this is a traditional sort of still photograph or this is a multiple is there is that just on a feeling or how would you decide that i think again it depends on what it is about the landscape that's caught me so um my piece in the ra for example is a classic landscape piece you know like i say a more traditional landscape photograph and that is i would never choose to do that particular um that particular scene in a different way because um, there's something about the honesty and the integrity of certain elements or parts of the landscape that I feel just need to be represented how they are. Um, but if I choose um, to do a multiple exposure, so for example, I have some multiple exposures from sunsets on the coast and i'm not a big sunset photographer i don't have a lot of um you know kind of bold sunset colors but there is still something so wonderful about the light at sunset and those tones that you get and i think particularly at the coast you've got those warm oranges fading up to the blues 
especially after the sun has, you know, just dropped behind the horizon. And so for me, it, it, with a scene like that, I'm looking to try and convey the tones and the colours more than the straight horizon, you know, and, 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 you know, the sand to the sea to the sky kind of thing. So I'm, I'm using something like multiple exposure or ICM to represent the mood that's created by the tone and the light more than the, the, the landscape, if that makes sense. Okay, maybe we can talk about sort of abstract photography for a bit then. Um, so was it during the lockdowns that you sort of discovered abstract photography? When did that sort of come on your radar sort of officially? Um, yeah, so it was in the lockdowns. I'm trying to think when exactly. Um, I think uh, so. I think it was around towards the end of 2020. Um, so I first came across Valda Bailey's work. Um, as a, uh, she's a multiple exposure photographer. Um, and that was how I, I think that was what piqued my interest in multiple exposure. But I had no desire to go and recreate what Valda had done. Um, but I wanted to understand more about the technique and learn about the technique. And I think, I think, you know, with photography, it, it's easy to, to think of it as, one um you know classic photography you know classic landscapes um and and not think of the possibilities of what you can do with a camera um and obviously that depends a little bit on your camera and what type of camera you've got but um it, it made me realize that actually there were a lot more opportunities for creative expression and that's why i started to explore um multiple exposures with um with icm as well um and i and i still feel like i'm in my infancy with that journey i think i've discovered a way of using that technique that does help me portray what i see um but i i also feel that i've yet you know i don't i certainly don't feel like i've peaked with how i'm going to use that technique in photography mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I spoke to Valda a couple of years ago, a few years ago, actually, um, because it, I think it was 2018, I was going to start a podcast and then I didn't see it through. And then I really used the recording that we had in 2020 when I started this podcast. Um, and I, I don't shoot that way at all. I don't necessarily, I mean, I know, I, I know what she's doing, like, I know she's doing multiple exposures and stuff. I don't exactly know how she's putting it all together, but I just really admire it. It's not something I, I don't think I would have the patience or anything to do. So although I don't really understand it, I, I was trying to think of how to say this er earlier before we came on um, without sounding like completely like s stupid or offensive. But I, I was like, I think it's like opera, you know, I, I know that something amazing is happening, even though I don't under, really understand everything that's going on, mm -hmm. you can still appreciate that something epic is in front of you. And I think I feel that way about Valda's work, really. Yeah, so I was just going to say, I, I, I think, you know, she has a she has a great vision for it. And I think she uses a, a, a you know, I believe she uses a mix of, um, you know, camera and and software to, to compile her work. And then she also does some fantastic um you know things she she will embellish her prints with um with mixed media as well so um you know she's she's really uh she's got a great creative mindset um mm. f you know for using that technique um i don't see myself perhaps going as abstract as some of valda's work i still certainly at the moment I still want my multiple exposures to be identifiable as landscapes. Um, mm. And and even I would go so far as to say, to be able to identify that it's a tree or it's a big vista or, you know, it's a coastal. Um, so I don't see myself going quite as abstract as that, but certainly, um, certainly on a journey with it. 
I think like for me with photographers like you, Valda, it's the permission, you know, it's like, it's saying, okay, landscape photography or whatever kind of photography you're into, it doesn't have to be this, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It doesn't have to be what she's doing, what you're doing. It doesn't have to be anything. Like you can do what you want to do and it's okay. Um, I think that's the biggest takeaway that's applicable for me. And rather than saying, okay, now I have to put gold leaf on my prints and whatever. Yeah. So that permission, I think, is so freeing for people. You seem to just have it. So I don't know, um, did you, was there ever a time where you were shooting according to the rules or did it come easily to you to just say, okay, I can just do what I want to do here? Yeah, I think, um, I think it did come quite easily to me. Um, Certainly when I first picked my camera back up in the beginning of 2020, um, initially I thought to myself, um, like a lot of people, you think, right. So I, uh, you know, I want, I got myself some filters and I wanted to really play with filters and long exposures. And, um, and so I, I was going out and shooting, um, with, you know, sort of, techniques which we see more commonly shall we say um and that's really important part of your learning curve and um you know i, I went down I, I live on the, in the south and um on you know southeast of england and i went down to new haven where they where you've got the lighthouse and sort of work with some long exposures there to smooth out the sea um and eventually I sort of I sort of realized that that I enjoyed the process I really enjoyed doing it but looking at the final result I was pleased with the technical expertise that I'd gained and applied but I didn't really look at the photograph and think oh that that really speaks to me that's something that um that represents what I'm about um and then I, I did a work, I did a creative development workshop, um, an online creative development workshop with Rachel Talabart. Uh, and I think with the workshop gave me, uh, I really lacked confidence. Actually, I really lacked confidence. I, I'd already started to play with multiple exposures a little bit. Um, and I'd already started to photograph, um, the landscape in a way that didn't follow the classic rules. Um, but I felt very unsure um, about, around how it would be received. And I think we all do, don't we, as photographers, we all worry um, about how our work will be received. Um, and what those workshops gave me was confidence to uh, and permission to stay true to my creative mindset. And so I, I just carried on on that path that, you know, I would go out with my cameras. It's, it's a bizarre feeling when I when I'm taking multiple exposures because they're all done in camera. I don't stack them in Photoshop or anything. So they're all in camera multiple exposures. So I have to do the sort of mental gymnastics first, thinking what settings am I going to use? How many exposures do I need to use to get the, the scene how I want it? Um, and when I hold the camera and I'm photographing in that way, it's like it just becomes an extension of my hand. It's not on the tripod most of the time. Um, sometimes it, it might be on the tripod, but most of the time it's not. And it, it's almost like I'm just, you know, <laughs> wafting around a paintbrush in the landscape. It's really, it's a really freeing experience to stand in there with it on a tripod, looking for the foreground interest, the mid ground, looking at your two thirds, you know, and, and, and the, your classic composition rules and things. It's such a freeing experience to, to work in a more creative way with a camera. When, when you're working in that way, then like, do you have to pre visualize or, or is this something that get you get better with the more that you do it about saying, okay, well, this is what I'm seeing, but this is what I, could create with seven exposure i don't know like how does mm. how do you get from the point of going oh wait a second to being sort of finished you know and how long can that take so um i was saying in the early days it was a lot of experimentation to really understand what the output is 
of using multiple exposure in camera and the various settings that you apply to it. Um, but once you understand that, once you know what the camera is going to produce, um, then you can look at the scene and think, right, I want these settings um, in order to layer and create the scene as I want it. Um, there's a photograph which is one of my favourites, which is was taken up on Dartmoor um, down in Devon. And it was a, just a big open landscape. But what caught me was these lovely soft curves of the um, of the moors, you know, the way the hills just kind of rolled into each other. And that was what I really wanted to emphasise. So I used a couple of exposures um, and just layered them. Um, and, 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 and there was some sort of forest in the foreground, um, which also helped to... Um, balance the photograph with with the with the sky at the top and sort of negative space um, and then these rolling hills in the middle so I I knew looking at that landscape what it was that I wanted to try and create with the multiple exposure but that took a lot of time and a lot of playing and a lot of experimenting to know what I needed to do in order to create that effect um, so in the early days you you, you know you you really are playing about and experimenting and learning um, and the outputs it was wonderful about it is the outputs are really surprising and they can be really exciting you know when you get mm -hmm. get home and you you know you kind of look at it on the back of the camera and you think oh yeah I think I quite like that and then you get it home and you, you you know you sort of download it onto your computer and pull it up in Lightroom and and that's when you get really excited about you know what the possibilities are and what you can do. Mm -hmm. So um, I think some people, I think touched on this earlier, would struggle with the sort of freedom, the unrestrictedness of this kind of photography. If somebody is there, they're curious, they shoot in a sort of ABC kind of joining the dots way. I'm just talking about myself, but I'm sure there are other people. Um, and I like that. I mean, it gets my job done. I mean, there's there's definitely room for creativity in what I do. I just don't like to do it in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, usually I wouldn't rely on myself to be creative in the moment. So if I'm going to be creative, I try to do it in, in the front end and then go and join the dots. I'm a commercial photographer. I have to get the job done. Sure. Um, once I get what I've got in mind in the bag, then I would kind of loosen up a bit and be more inclined to try things. Anyway, to come back to my question, I think, yeah, a, a lot of people would struggle with the idea of just being um, so open in the moment. What advice, or if any, could you give someone to help someone to embrace or know how to work with less restrictions? Does that make sense? And could you say anything about that? Yeah, so um, I think it is that thing about what catches your eye. Um, if you go into the landscape with preconceived rules about how to make a photograph, um, then you're almost forcing yourself to look at the landscape in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you go out with, throw the rules away um, and just see what you can see and I would I would say you know maybe stay off of social media for a while because it's also dangerous for us I think sometimes we see something and we don't necessarily want to copy it but our heads become quite ingrained with what we constantly see on social media so that I think can become a very subcon subconscious influencer um, and we get stereotypical things that we have to do, don't we? Like in springtime, we need to go and photograph the bluebells in the woodland, and in autumn, we have to go and get the woods in autumn, the colour. And um, but actually, just go out, and every step that you take, just look to the side, looking, look in front, look to the ground, look to the sky. Um, don't necessarily look too far ahead and just see what catches your eye and if something catches your eye just stop and work out why it's caught your eye and then think about how you might be able to turn that into a composition 
but remembering that composition doesn't necessarily have to mean that you've got to have a rock in the foreground and a stream in the middle leading up to a mountain peak. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I love that kind of landscape photography. Don't get me wrong. I absolutely do love it. And I watch, you know, some of the really well-known YouTubers doing that for a living. Um, mm -hmm. And I get a lot of enjoyment from that, um, from what they do and what they create. Um, but it's not what I'm trying to, it's not my way of approaching it. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. I only laughed because you described many of my own landscape photographs there. <laughs> Let's move on to the gear round. That has been awesome, by the way. I've so enjoyed uh, talking with you there. Thank you. Um, okay, let's go into the gear round. Um, camera and lens, where are you at? What's a, a go-to camera lens? I noticed you're not shooting wide-angle lenses. It doesn't seem like that. For, for no. Me. So what are you shooting with? So I have a Canon 5D Mark IV, um, which has the capability to do up to nine exposures in camera. Um, and... I have a um, 70, sorry, 24 to 70 f4 lens, and I have a 70 to 200 f2.8, and I have a two times extender that will take that to 400 millimeters. Um, so most of the time, I would say 75% of the time, I've got my 70 to 200 on, um, but I do use my 24 to 70 and and it might sound strange but i'm currently looking at the 16 to 35 f 2.8 um because i want to start playing a bit more with wider angle multiple exposures in the landscape with the zoomy lens then what kind of advantage does that give you how does that help you to see things i think often the landscapes that I shoot, because most of my work, I would say 95% of my work is local. Um, and a lot of it is in the common lands that are around where I live. And you're quite restricted with your access onto it um, because off the footpaths, they're quite boggy. Um, you know, you literally could just sink if you're not careful <laughs> after the rains. Um, so as much as anything, it's about reach. Um but also um, having the f2.8 just gives you more flexibility, you know, for how soft or sharp you want the image um, and working, you know, creating some bokeh and, and those kind of things. Um, it's a great lens. I really love it. It's heavy. It's, it's not the best if you're going hiking uphill. Um, but, um, but I don't, I, yeah, I think I do want to work with a wider lens because I, I don't know what I'm missing at the moment. Does that make sense? Because I have, yeah. I've not really done it that much. So, yeah, it's it's a different ball game. I I find. I mean, it's it's just a totally different way of seeing. Um, so yeah, good luck with that. Uh, I was going to ask about filters. Are you using ND filters then, or, or you don't do that so much now? Yeah, I have. I have. Um, I have Lee filters. Um, I have my little stopper, which unfortunately my cat decided to kick off the side the other day which smashed <laughs> so, <laughs> so i need to replace that one um but yeah i've got a few, i've got a few leaf filters and a polarizer i use my polarizer uh you know a, a fair amount shall we say when, when the conditions are wet um and um I, the trouble is i don't like especially with the multiple exposures um I, I, you know i've got to confess i'm a bit I, I get a bit irritated with gear i get a bit irritated faffing around with with you know too much stuff um mm -hmm. I, d I not because um not because i'm lazy but because you know i just see something and i get excited and i just i just want to be free and, and start playing um but um but the filters are really beneficial at times you know obviously when you're doing your your icm uh you know and, you, and you're going to have a slightly longer um shutter speed um so yeah i do i do use my filters for sure Mm -hmm. and then processing or just lightroom that kind of normal stuff yeah the vast majority again 90 percent of it's just in lightroom occasionally i'll pull something into photoshop only because i i, I quite like the um uh the healing brush in photoshop more than the mm -hmm. one in lightroom um mm -hmm. and and occasionally I'll, I'll tweak a bit more with the um with the camera raw tool in Lightroom I don't know why I think it's probably the same one as 
sorry, in Photoshop, the one in Photoshop, I think it's probably the same as the one in Lightroom, but I just prefer the way, it, the way the tools work um, mm -hmm. in Photoshop. But most of the time, I don't, I don't actually spend a lot of time processing any of the photographs, even though some of them look like they've been processed a lot because I might have like really pulled down the shadows or the blacks to allow the, like, for example, to allow blossom to pop. You know, if it's blossom that's caught my eye, I'm not interested in the fir trees in the background. So I want to kind of, you know, obscure those as much as possible. Okay, thanks for that. All right, moving on. This round is called Double Exposure. And I will ask you about one photograph of yours and then I'll throw it back to you to tell me about another one, if that makes sense. Sure. You mentioned it. I was just, I've got a few of your pictures looked out here. Uh, it's always really tricky to decide which one to go with, but... You mentioned it, I think, just now. So the one I've chosen, it's called, well, it's on your Instagram from the 26th of March, and the caption says, Bright Blossom Tree Against Backdrop of Dark Pines. Um, do, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's quite it a, looks it's got this like heavy turquoisey ex... blues. Oh, okay, yeah, I'm colorblind, but I'll go with <laughs> oh, okay. it. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's like an explosion, and I love this kind of image. I, I really like it. Um, and uh, yeah, you said before as well, you don't have like a style, you know, um, like you're not repeating one technique over and over again. Um, but this is the image is definitely in your style and I'll, I'll let you maybe describe it and tell us if there's a story behind that one. Yeah, sure. So, um, again, sort of really local spot, the bottom of a field, um, that I pass on the school run and, um, early morning fog hanging around um and and there's a there's a collection of um shrubs and bushes in that area that that are all in blossom in spring and there's a some some of it was white blossom some of it was sort of pinker in color um and they the they sit in front of some very dark green foliage um so they're not backdropped against the sky um or you know there isn't there isn't a lot of distance they're quite close to the to what's in the background so the blossom really stands out you know it really does strike you as this sort of delicate floating snow almost um mm. and so that was a very intentional use of multiple exposure on that image I, I picked out one of the um one of the little trees there and um used i think three exposures on that one um and i needed to make sure that my my histogram was slightly more um slightly more to the left so that i wasn't going to pick up too much of the highlights in the background um but obviously with the blossom being white those that, that was retained and then I just emphasize that a bit more with my processing in in Lightroom but yeah I love that image actually I, I've had quite a, quite a lot of people have um sent me comments about that one on Instagram yeah I was wondering about the multiple exposure technique on a, a scene like that if it's a good way to just knock out any other you know unsightly bits of the image that you don't really want to see it you know because mm. you just sort of abstract maybe any scrubby bits on the ground or whatever but um the the overall effect is amazing so i'm seeing like a, a valda bailey influence on that would you agree with that or uh yeah possibly I, th I know she did something with blossom trees didn't she early on um uh, like like proper big big blossom trees if you know what i mean um as in apple blossom cherry blossom um so yeah, pro yeah, there probably is some influence from Valder's work in that, um, but um, I think I've processed it quite differently. Um, she may have something similar actually that I've I've not seen, but I certainly I certainly wasn't picturing um, anything that I'd noticed noticed when I was doing that one. Okay, you don't do that. I think I'm 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 sensing that more than referencing a particular image. So, mm. um, and anything, if I could throw this back to you, obviously the the picture that's in the exhibition is is always going to be special. But is there an image or a moment from your uh, photography journey that's just super memorable or has a great story to go with it? Uh, yeah, there's one which is oh, I call it gilded. 
Um, so on the face of it, it looks, it's very gold in color. Um, and there's, uh, and it's, and it's actually fog that's been illuminated by um, quite high winter sun. Um, and the rays of light are, are coating these um, naked silver birch trees that are covered in water droplets. And it was just such, it was just such a moment. And what I love about this photograph is um, it was unexpected. It was very unplanned. I was actually walking, walking and not looking in that direction. And I heard something and I glanced to the left and I spotted the light. Again, it was that thing about just seeing. And I spotted the light striking these silver birch trees, but it was all, they were shrouded in this um, mist as the, um, as the sun was starting to warm up the, the, the ground beneath the trees. Um, and so, I, you know, I stopped and I, and I looked and, and, I, and I took that photograph. And what I love about it is it's, it's actually quite a classic. It, there's no multiple exposure. There's no, um, there's, there's no over processing. It's, it's, it's pretty much, you know, as it was uh mm -hmm. in the moment so that's that's a that is a real fake i've got it printed on my wall downstairs and and it's yeah. really lovely printed you can really pick out the details it's so amazing it's so effective it really looks like gold do you know what i mean um mm. and so processing wise it just come in the camera like that and that was the color yeah i think uh i actually had to cool it down slightly with the white balance it was a bit too warm um, and that, I think that was my own fault, as in I hadn't altered my white balance settings and it would, they were set slightly warmer than they should have been. Um, but yeah, no, there was very little processing. You know, there's no vignette on it. There, there's no graduated filters. Um, I think I, looking at it, I've probably added a tiny bit of clarity and contrast just to pick up mm -hmm. that light, you know, that, that sense of the light radiating in from the top left of the image. Mm -hmm. But yeah, minimal processing on it. Yeah, that makes sense. So I, I don't know if you're selling prints, but I, I mean, I can see a lot of your work lending itself really well to that. Is that something you have plans for? I do. Um, and uh, I've had, you know, I've been, um, I've been blessed actually with a lot of people have contacted me asking me uh, if they can buy certain prints. Um, and I'm just in the process at the moment. So my website, I, again, I get, I'm not very, I'm not very techy and I don't enjoy building websites and things. Mm -hmm. Um, but I've, um, I have, I have now got a website, um, and I have, uh, it's not live, but I have a shop in progress. Um, I'm just finalizing a few things. I've got my own printer. I've got my own sort of, um, Canon pro 1000 printer at home and I can print up to, um, a two, um, but I'm thinking of going out to a professional, uh, you know, print uh, printers to, to fulfill the orders. Um, and I'm just kind of finalizing how I do that at the moment, because obviously it impacts things like whether or not they're signed and additioned by hand mm -hmm. or they have a certificate of authentication and the shipping and the, you know, the sort of little personal details, which are really important to me. Um, mm -hmm. and that's all come from my experience with the RA, you know, what I've learned there. So, <clears throat> so yeah, so, um, prints will definitely be available. I am dragging my feet a little bit on it, but also I'm working with my mentor on it. So I don't want to rush it. I want to get it right. Yeah. I think that's the thing, isn't it? Because you, you do you want it. You don't want to have to go and um, go back to the drawing board if you just don't hit it right the first time sure I was talking to Jonathan Critchley not long ago yeah I listened I, I would I mean he sells big fine art prints I, yeah. I don't know if you're thinking big or small or whatever but I know the way he does it it seems to um, create a higher value to the to the piece which is always you know yeah. always good but I, there's different ways to do it I mean it's so difficult so and I think my, uh, the work in the RA, you know, it's sold for a price that I'm really pleased with. Um, and it's a big, you know, it's a 36 by 24 inch print and framed. It's 1.1 meters wide. So it's not small. Um, mm. And that, um, yeah, that's, that's definitely one of the reasons I'm, I'm looking to go out to a, to a, a you know, professional printers is to give me that flexibility with size as well. Mm-hmm. 
yeah well we'll look forward to that i, I wish you the best with that journey because it is <laughs> tricky but um okay this um i've so enjoyed this this brings us to motor drive it's the final round and okay. I got feedback from a listener the other day who said they love the motor drive round so um <laughs> <laughs> okay so some quick questions okay yep wide angle or telephoto telephoto at the moment yeah um expensive lens cloth or the corner of your shirt uh corner of my shirt but often not accessible because it's usually freezing cold and i've got loads of layers on <laughs> yeah so corner of your jacket um expensive no i just did that one <laughs> what's your favorite emoji oh um there's just like a blushing smiley face that i use sometimes when i'm thanking somebody for a, a kind comment on a photograph Okay, I don't know if we really said on the episode where you're based, but best thing to do in your town, in your area? Oh, in my area? Um, well, I live right between the North and South Downs. So, yeah, exploring the Downs, they're just beautiful. You know, nobody nobody comes and photographs in the southeast of England, which is great, you know, unless you live here. Um, but it there is an abundance of opportunities here. Um, you know, everybody goes to the Lake District in Scotland and Cornwall and Devon and things, you know, where, where, where we've all seen the classic photographs. Um, but yeah, um, explore the downs. They are stunning. Mm -hmm. So what's a down? Is it like a moor or what? Yeah, it's it? like a big, uh, like an area of outstanding national beauty. Lots of, um, in fact, Surrey, the county that I live in, is the most wooded county in the country. There is more woodland in Surrey than anywhere else in the country. Um, okay. And because it's all protected land, there's huge areas that have no um, no construction, no housing. Mm -hmm. That's great. So it's mainly sort of woodland rather than open. Kind. Yeah, very little farmland. Um, there, are, there are there is open open land, but it's there's not that much farmland. Mm -hmm. So it's quite in, like you're not far from London and I was just saying we were down in London the other day when you come back to Aberdeen you're like oh there's spaces between the buildings <laughs> um like everything is is just jammed in there and connected and there's just no gaps you know so how far down like how far out of London do you need to go before you see some space I would say if you get the other side of the M25 then it starts to open out. Um, so if you if you if you look at a map and look at the M25, um, there is space inside the M25. You know, the closer you get to it, the more open it begins begins to come. But if you can get down to sort of Woking and beyond, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Guildford, you've got the North Downs um, sort of up uh, up north of Guildford, and then the South Downs are south south of Guildford. So if you want to get into that area, then yeah, and go see. Go see the common lands, Thursday Common, Hankley Common, although Hankley Common sadly just had a big wildfire um, two weeks ago. Um, and um, yeah, the commons are beautiful. Very different okay. landscape as well, I think, for the UK. Okay. Um, what's a weird thing I could find in your camera bag? <laughs> I think it's probably, I still think of it as weird, a face mask. <laughs> um, it was just one of those things that I thought, oh, I better always have one for emergencies. And they seem almost a distant memory now, but it is a weird thing to have in a camera bag, I think. It's always going to be yeah. weird to think that you have to carry a face mask. Yeah, I meant to follow up earlier, actually. I, like, how are you now for mi mingling and mixing? Yeah, I'm fine. So I wasn't like one of the, uh, I was like one of the mid-level, if you like, kind of vulnerable. I had treatment regularly for my it's an autoimmune condition um so it just just means that my immune system's a bit compromised at, at times um but yeah i'm fine i you know i i've sort of um went back to work fully integrated i've even had covid now like most people um, and i was absolutely fine with it i mean thankfully i'd had all the vaccines so um yeah, yeah no worries okay um name a photographer we should know i don't know if that's your favorite in your field out of your field or just a great photographer people should know about Oh, um, so I'm going to go maybe a little bit off piece, but um, Vivian Meyer, uh, she's a, she was a photographer in the 1930s. She photographed a lot of street photography, uh, a lot of um, street portrait portraiture photography um, in America, Chicago, New York. And 
I discovered her work. I can't even remember how I discovered her work. I think it was in a book. I was in um, the Photographer's Gallery in London. They've got a great bookshop. And, um, yeah, there's just something about it. The, the, she has a, had a real way of capturing people's character. Um, really lovely work, actually, I would say. Um, I, think, I believe there's an Instagram account. Um, so, yeah, worth looking up. Okay. I've looked that up. Is that something you would be curious to explore or are you happy to stay with the landscape? Uh, that's a really good question because um, I increasingly find myself looking more towards that type of photography. Um, I, I love photographs that, that have a really strong sense of story about them. And whenever you've got people in photographs, you know, in, in a very natural setting, there's a huge amount of storytelling going on there. Um, so I'm not going to say never. Um, but I think as a, and I think that's why I was saying earlier, I'm not going to be tied to a plan because my photography, I feel, can only be authentic if it's led by where I'm at at that point in time. And at this point in time, it's about, seeing silence about getting space from mm -hmm. all the noise that's in my head and that's not necessarily bad noise it's just noise it's just there um but one day that might be something i might explore mm -hmm. so i just love your uh, mindset around your work it's it's so i think it's very um constructive very helpful for you to to have the kind of um freedom that you have around it but Thank also you. not just going down a rabbit hole because you you know you know maybe I want to shoot people now. So yeah, I like that. Um, I was going to say as well, your slogan on your website is the best. See sand skyland is the best. Um, did you come up with that yourself? Yeah, I just <laughs> I, I was just sitting there thinking, you know, when you I I mean in my Instagram account, I only created it. When did I create it? That was in lockdown as well, twenty twenty, I think. And um, I was, you know, you have to fill in your profile, your bio and whatever. And I never write much. You know, I'm not I'm not big on writing big spiels about myself on those things. So I just wanted something simple and succinct. And um, I don't identify as a, you know, a seascape photographer or woodland photographer. I think for me, again, that would I'd find that would stifle my creativity because I'd constantly be seeing things that I want to photograph and I'd feel like I wasn't allowed to because I'm because I've, you know, identified with a certain um, part of the landscape. That's And that's not, you know, a criticism of anybody who does do that because of the people that do do that do it for a reason because that's obviously what they connect with, but that's just not me. So I just thought, well, what do I photograph? And I photographed the sea, the sand, the land and the sky. <laughs> and mm -hmm. that was it, really. Yeah, cool. Last one. When do you feel at peace with the universe? Oh... I had a moment actually the other night I couldn't sleep very well and I went um I went downstairs and and it was a very warm still night and I sat out in the garden um it was about 1 a.m the stars were really bright and um I want to say a, a, I think it was perhaps a meteor that passed by um, or, or something, it, it, it wasn't a shooting star, it was too big, it was moving too slow and there was a big yellow trail behind it. Um, so I don't think it was a shooting star. Um, but whenever I am in a, that very still, quiet landscape in the dark, looking up at the stars, and maybe it's because you've used the word universe, but that is when I feel, a, you know, that's probably the only other time I feel a great stillness and a connection with this, and, and awe, complete awe, that we are this little planet really amongst this huge amazing universe amazing thank you so much thank you so much wendy um this has just been a super blast for me just keep doing what you're doing you're doing great and i'll, I'll enjoy to see how things develop for you thanks so much thank you very much graham i've really enjoyed chatting to you thanks for listening follow wendy on instagram and check out her website to see more of her fantastic photography links to everything we spoke about are in the show notes if you enjoyed this episode check out my conversations with valda bailey paul sanders karen waller shorna perkins stephanie johnson and dylan nardini many more photographers of the same kind of mindset 
hope I can see you at Viewfinders Live with Paul Sanders on the 13th of October. That's all for now. Enjoy your photography and I'll see you out there.